The electric car industry has many problems, and at the top of the list is the obsession that many commentators and industry insiders have with Tesla. Sure, it's the company that really kick-started the modern electric car industry. It's the company that's years ahead when it comes to vehicle production volumes, battery technology, and charging infrastructure. Without Tesla, we wouldn't be where we are today. And as someone who works in the industry and has been driving and covering electric vehicles for more than 13 years, I'm frankly extremely grateful for its existence and its products. Being at the forefront of the sector, Tesla has become the company to beat, at least if you're interested in producing a car that is faster, quicker, longer-legged, or more powerful. And thus, we have, as a consequence, become a little transfixed with the term Tesla killer, be it applied to a startup with a tech-filled luxurious car with a high sticker price, or a legacy automaker looking to enter into the plug-in world with a flagship high-ticket model. It is frankly extremely overused. It doesn't help either that an unhealthy number of Tesla loyal online see anything that isn't a Tesla as somehow subpar or pointless. To many, if it doesn't travel as far as a Tesla, have the same performance as a Tesla, come with autopilot, or make use of the supercharger network, it's simply something that we automotive journalists should not cover. Some even go as far as to wish the death of the mainstream auto industry, every legacy brand and every other plug-in vehicle manufacturer in the segment. Something I'd argue is actually against Tesla's original mission statement and, frankly, is incredibly toxic. For those people, the term Tesla killer is actually something to use to mock vehicles perceived as subpar with. But today, I'm going to argue why it's time to forget about trying to beat Tesla, why it's time to forget about that term, Tesla killer, and why Renault's multi-day e-ways online event is going to be responsible for a vehicle that has the potential to spark a true revolution in the way we think about and use electric vehicles today. Because as far as I can tell, there's a second voice in the electric vehicle world, one that doesn't state if it isn't Tesla, it isn't any good. This voice is very different. It's the voice that says, I want to go electric, but I just want an electric car that gets me from A to B, one without bells and whistles, one I can afford. Today, those prayers have been answered, at least for European customers. Taking place now and running through until October 26, Renault's massive e-ways online event will lay out the future plans that Renault has for its mainstream brand, as well as its associated brands around the world – Dacia, Renault Samsung Motors, Alpine and Lada. And with Renault already enjoying a strong position in Europe, its Zoe electric hatchback is currently the continent's number one electric vehicle in terms of sales volumes, I think we have some great things to look forward to over the next nine days. And even on its initial day today, we were treated to two world premieres in the form of the Renault Megane E-Vision and the Dacia Spring Electric. And while the Renault Megane E-Vision, a concept car that previews an all-electric version of the popular Renault Megane hatchback that will eventually debut as a production model sometime next year, was in of itself a very impressive car that, dare I say it, reminded me a little of the Nissan Aria. It's really the other vehicle that was revealed today that got me super excited. And it's the one that I think highlights it's time to stop focusing on high-end cars and get everybody plugging in. Previewed earlier this year as a concept, the Dacia Spring unveiled today is a European market homologated cousin to the Renault KZE, which is in of itself an all-electric budget variant of the Renault Quid internal combustion engine crossover. It's a car that, like the rest of the Dacia family, is designed to offer great value for money without the bells and whistles that usually push up the price of a brand new car. And while we don't know the official launch pricing yet, I've heard rumours of under €20,000 before incentives, Renault is promising that it will be the most affordable electric car you'll be able to buy in Europe. Granted, it's likely to cost twice the price of the KZE, or at least the price the KZE is expected to sell for when it goes on sale next year in India and China, but it's still far less than most other electric cars on sale today. And it's a little larger than its nearest electric car competitor in terms of price, 
the Volkswagen e-up, which is also sold as the Seat Mi Electric Plus, and Skoda Citigo e-iv, order books for which I believe have now closed forever. So let's look at the car, its specs, and detail why we think it is such an important car. First, design. There's not a lot to differentiate the spring from the second generation of the internal combustion engine Renault Quid that's already available in India for under three lakhs, or three and a half thousand euro. And that's because the Quid, the KZE, and the Dacia Spring all share the same body. That said, there have been some tweaks for the European market. There's alloy wheels instead of the steel wheels on the Asian market Quid, and of course, there's what I'm going to call a Dacia branding pack, tweaking the front and rear to make it follow Dacia's standard design language. To my eyes, the interior has been given a tweak too in terms of trim materials to make it more appealing to European buyers. I'm also guessing there's probably more airbags in order to comply with European crash test standards, more than you'd find in the Asian market cars, but don't quote me on that. Behind the driver's wheel, there's a fairly conventional traditional dashboard with a small 3.5 inch LCD screen in between the two main dials. In addition to providing the basis for menus that allow you to change various vehicle settings, Dacia says it can also be used to interact with either Google or Apple voice recognition. Air conditioning isn't available as standard, nor is a center touchscreen display, but these can be added as optional extras, along with power mirrors and a spare wheel, something that's kind of rare on many electric vehicles today. The center touch display, if configured correctly, can use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, has Bluetooth, and can use voice commands. There's also a built-in sat-nav system as part of that optional bundle, but to be honest, I'd expect most people to just use their phone and CarPlay or Android Auto. As a side, while a centre touchscreen display isn't standard, Telematics is. There's a new app coming to market for both Android and iOS called MyDacia, which will allow customers to check out the state of charge of their vehicle, its range, locate their car, and activate preconditioning, if applicable. It also lets customers turn on and turn off charging if the car is plugged in. A final thought on the interior? The cabin reminds me quite a lot of cars from the early 90s. It's no frills, but comfortable. I'm not sure I'd want to spend a road trip in it, but then again, that's not what this car is for. Which brings me to the powertrain. The Dacia Spring is not a quick car. Its 33 kilowatt motor drives the front wheels and I'm guessing gives a double digit sprint time. It's not noted by Renault or Dacia anywhere and I think its absence is with a good reason. It's not a quick car. Speed-wise, while the Asian market version of this car, the Renault KZE, is limited to 65 miles per hour or 105 kilometers per hour, the Dacia Spring EV can hit 78 miles per hour, 125 kilometers per hour, where legal and safe. Using the WLTP test cycle, which I know is optimistic, Dacia claims a 183 mile or 295 kilometer range using the city test cycle, or 140 miles, 225 kilometers on the mixed cycle. Given that this car has a 26.8 kilowatt hour battery pack, that's actually bang on what I would expect of a car of this size and weight, with a real world achievable range likely to be closer to 120 miles or so, which is 191 kilometers. DC quick charging at speeds of up to 30 kilowatts is available if you specify it at point of order. Yes, it is an optional extra, and yes, it's limited to 30 kilowatts in order to keep the pack healthy and ensure a long life. Regular charging is possible from a household outlet or a dedicated charging station, thanks to a 7.4 kilowatt onboard AC charger. A full charge using that method can take as little as five hours. Dacia says the Spring Electric comes with a three year, 100,000 kilometer all round warranty, with the battery coming in with an eight year, 120,000 kilometer warranty. While that might probably seem small, remember that cars with smaller battery packs do have to work their battery packs harder than a comparable car with a much larger battery pack. At this point, I expect some of you at least to be looking at this vehicle and asking why on earth I'm so excited about it and why we're even bothering to cover it. After all, it has a pretty terrible range compared to most electric vehicles on sale today. It only has optional DC quick charging. It's not standard. 
And those roof rails, at least if they're anything like the Asian market quid, might be aesthetic rather than functional. I don't know if that's the case for this vehicle, but I do know it's true in Indian market quids. My answer of why we're giving it attention? It's a new car that should, on paper at least, be eligible for new car grants in Europe. And that sub €20,000 price tag before incentives should mean that this little plug-in could cost about the same as Renault's entry-level gasoline car, the Clio SCE 75. It not only means price parity, but it also means that there is zero excuse to not switch to electric. Sure, it may be a little bare bones, but so too are entry-level gasoline cars. And while the range may make the average viewer in North America or Australia or frankly anywhere with large expanses of nothing in between major cities cringe, it's far less of a problem in Europe, where cities are a lot closer together and everything is more tightly packed. When it comes to commutes, most Europeans travel less than 40 kilometers per day to get to work. Sure, this won't be a car for more remote rural areas, but in most major urban areas, this car could really revolutionize who gets behind the wheel of an EV. Ultimately, frankly, it's not about how fast an electric car can travel or how many features it has that I believe is most important. It's that fuel source. If the Dacia Spring can lower the cost of entry to EVs and get more people plugging in, then ultimately it is a fantastic win all round. Finally, Europeans are known for being a little more pragmatic about their cars. As I've detailed before on this channel, most Europeans I know are less interested in the status symbol part of car ownership. They're more interested in the value that they can get out of their car as a functional tool. For this reason, you're more likely to see C-level business people driving around in old beaters than you might in North America. And I think this car might appeal to them too, for that very reason. So there you have it. It's small, it's basic, and it doesn't have screens up the wazoo. And based on what some of you have been telling me for years, that's exactly what you want your EV to be. The only downside for our friends in the UK, there are currently no plans to make this car available there. And I'd suspect it might tie over for those in other right-hand drive markets too. Sorry. That's it. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.